and you'll then be able to get something and that's enough. But the main thing from my point of view is make sure you practice outside of clinic almost as much as you can. Um, okay, so why don't we start? If I can get this thing to work. Okay, so guys, a resource for today, uh, there's a medical student, one of your colleagues who started these UWA med talk podcasts. Do you guys, any of you listen to them? Yeah, a couple of months. Um, him and I have done one or two or three, I can't remember how many now, but there's one on there for red eyes. So if you're driving or on the bus, then that's a good way to revise some of the stuff we're gonna talk about today. Logbook I've mentioned, and yeah, you do need to have all five marked off. Um, so if you can't do it on a patient, then just do it on each other, I think that's fine. Uh, and if the registrar isn't sure, just tell them that I've said it <laughs> in a lecture. So what we're gonna talk about today is a bit of, so it's gonna be about acute red eye. I'll talk about some relevant anatomy. We went over some anatomy a couple of weeks ago for those of you that were here but we'll go back for, to some relevant anatomy, then some directed history and examination, and then some approaches to red eye. How do you differentiate? How do you think about acute red eye? And finally, we'll end up with some cases. Because of the sick family at home, this lecture's ended up being a little bit shorter than I intended, um, but I'm quite happy to do another one later on this term. We've still got a few weeks um, to round out the red eye stuff. So relevant anatomy, this picture I put up again, you know, at the first, um, you know, at your first lecture, this is just to say, think about red eye from front to back. And so starting at the front, the lids and the lashes can be involved. Uh, the cornea is often involved in red eye presentations. Conjunctiva is often involved. Then you've got the sclera and the episclera, which I'll talk about a little bit later and the anterior chamber, the iris and the pupil, which are involved in anterior uveitis and acute angle closure glaucoma. I've got another image a bit later on with some of those conditions marked up, so don't worry about too much about taking notes for now. Um, a lot of it is the front part of the eye, the anterior segment rather than posterior segment, as far as non-ophthalmologists are concerned. So the common stuff that turns up to emergency departments in GPs usually is an anterior segment problem. So just be familiar with the main structures of the anterior segment. Just another way of, of looking at it. When you've got redness, often it's a conjunctiva that's involved. Sometimes it's the underlying sclera. So if you've got scleritis, uh, the cornea should be clear. If you've got a white infiltrate, let's say, on the cornea, this is, a, this is an artifact just from the camera flash. So that's not a true white infiltrate. Um, and then sometimes you get red lids with a white eye. So you've actually got a red eyelid presenting um, and you need to be able to differentiate those parts of the anatomy. Um, the lacrimal drainage system can become infected. So you'll remember the lacrimal sac that can become affected. That's called dacrocystitis and you end up getting red upper and lower lids on the nasal aspect. And that's usually because you've got an infection within the lacrimal sac. It's quite a serious presentation. And finally, the other bit of anatomy, uh, which you might remember from the first lecture, is aqueous humor, which, which gets produced by the ciliary body in the posterior chamber. And it travels around into the anterior chamber and drains through the angle of the anterior chamber into the trabecular meshwork. And when there's a blockage in this system somewhere, that's when people get acute angle closure glaucoma. So you need to be familiar with that. Um, concept as well. Okay, so what about some directed history? Let's talk about that. Fair bit to talk about here. And I'm actually going to go out of order because as I was driving here, I thought, what do I actually ask? If I've got a patient in front of me, I can see already whether they've got a unilateral or bilateral red eye. So if they're sitting in front of you, that's kind of moot. Uh, you're going to know their age as well. So then the next thing I often ask is about rate of onset. When did it start? How long have you had it? Um, and that can either be acute in terms of minutes 
subacute in terms of hours to days or chronic or intermittent and, and so on. Just be aware with, with older patients, particularly in GP, you'll get a lot of older patients turning up with eyes that are chronically and intermittently red and gritty. And the most common cause of that is blepharitis, which I'll talk about in the next lecture. Blepharitis is inflammation of the eyelid margin, and it goes hand in hand with dry eyes. So this is probably the commonest cause of red eye or uncomfortable eye in general practice is what's called blepharitis and dry eye. And it's more common in middle-aged people onwards, particularly 67 year olds and so on. Um, bilateral red eyes, most often conjunctivitis, most often that's infective conjunctivitis, but you can also have allergic conjunctivitis and the history should point you towards that. So allergic conjunctivitis is gonna be your patient with asthma or eczema, hay fever most commonly, and there's a seasonal pattern. Um, pain is important. Severe pain is a red flag. So severe pain is most common with microbial keratitis, which means an infection of the cornea, okay? And that's most common in people who wear contact lenses. So severe pain is a red flag. Think about microbial keratitis. The other thing that causes severe pain is acute anglocologic glaucoma. And that tends, that's, well, always unilateral. Uh, I've never seen a bilateral case. I suppose it's possible. Um, Acute angle closure tends to be middle-aged patient uh, or older. Uh, severe pain, associated headache to the point of um, vomiting, needing opioids. Uh, visions down, more common in Southeast Asia, people of Southeast Asian origin because of the shape of the eye. Uh, and more common in people who are hyperopic. You might remember hyperopic means long-sighted which means they can see well in the distance and, and not well up close. So get a sense for how severe the pain is out of 10. Photophobia or light sensitivity, that's a sort of hallmark for uveitis, anterior uveitis. So you've got inflammation of the anterior segment and the person's quite light sensitive. Happens in lots of conditions, but that's the sort of classic um, teaching. Uh, grittiness and stinging, again, happens in lots of conditions but very common in blepharitis, dry eye. Um, discharge from the eye, most common in conjunctivitis. So conjunctivitis, think of in terms of viral and bacterial, majority being viral, majority of those having clear discharge, bacterial being the minority, and they're more likely to have a whitish sort of discharge if it's bacterial conjunctivitis. Ask about what they were doing when they got the red eye. So were they outdoors? Were they doing, uh, is it a tradesman who was at work? Uh, was it someone who was outside in the garden? Uh, if they say, I get uncomfortable eyes that are a little bit red, or when I'm reading or when I'm driving, most common thing there is dryness. You'll be surprised how common dry eye is and how symptomatic it makes people. Um, it's a disease of age, middle age onwards, as I say. When you read or you drive or you do any concentrated activity like you guys are doing now, the rate of your blinking goes down. It, it about halves. And so if you're prone to dryness already and you're blinking less, you can imagine the surface of the eye dries out quite quickly. So they're sort of um, clues that it's a dry eye type condition. And finally, you, you want to know if the vision's affected or not. They'll tell you usually. But if the vision is badly affected, that's usually a more serious condition and you need to have a higher index of suspicion. Uh, past ocular history is important here, guys. I put contact lens wear right up the top because that's a red flag for microbial keratitis. If a patient turns up and they're a contact lens wearer and they've got an acute red eye, tell them to hang on to their contact lenses and the case that they put them in if they use a case because if it is microbial keratitis, we will culture those things to try and get a, um, a diagnosis, you know, a microbial diagnosis. Uh, if they've had recent surgery or recent injection into the eye, they're obviously risk factors for an infection. So you've got to have a, an index of suspicion there for endophthalmitis, which is definitely a red flag condition. 
endophthalmitis infection of the whole eye, most often from a gram-positive bacteria, and these days, most often after an injection or recent surgery. If they've had uh, previous episodes, so it's a recurrent red eye, that's a clue to a few different conditions, including uveitis. Uveitis can certainly be relapsing, remitting. Uh, I keep coming back to contact lenses, but that's because it's common. So contact lens where I may have had previous episodes. Uh, tradesmen will often have recurrent foreign bodies, FB, that's what that stands for. Uh, seasonality relates to allergy. So hay fever um, associated with usually spring or summer. Uh, and then anyone who's had a calasian or a sty uh, may well have had one in the past. So they'll come in with a red eyelid and they'll say, oh, I've had one, I had one two years ago or something like that. So they're the conditions that tend to recur more often. Um, if someone comes in and they're on steroid eye drops, find out where and why they were put on the steroid eye drops. Steroids are an immunosuppressant, so they should really only be started by an ophthalmologist. And if they're started for the wrong condition, so let's say you've got a viral keratitis, a viral infection of the cornea, and someone is mistakenly started on a steroid eye drop, that will rapidly make things worse. And this happens in the real world. So if someone's on a steroid, you want to know why and who started it. Uh, and hyperopia, as I said earlier, is the, the association with acute angle closure glaucoma in addition to middle age and Southeast Asian origin. What about past medical history? Well, if they've had a recent upper respiratory tract infection, that's often associated with viral conjunctivitis. A topic disease I mentioned, goes together with allergic conjunctivitis. Collagen vascular disorders or rheumatological conditions go together with uh, uveitis, episcleritis, and scleritis. Sjogren's is not common, but that's a cause of very dry eyes. But if someone's got, if you think about uveitis, episcleritis, or scleritis, these tend to be immune-mediated conditions. They can be infective, more commonly immune-mediated. Therefore, think about an underlying rheumatological or collagen vascular disorder. Rheumatoid arthritis is a common one. SLE, not common, but they're, they're the sort of ones you want to think about. Um, if someone has, comes in with shingles or has previously had shingles, then think about herpetic corneal infection. Okay, so they come in with a shingles rash and a red eye. You're thinking about a herpetic corneal involvement. Um, more commonly, it's actually herpes simplex rather than varicella, varicella causing shingles. So herpes simplex one would be the most common cause of uh, herpetic keratitis. So have you had a blister uh, on or around your eyelids? Uh, do you get cold sores? Have you recently had a cold sore? They're the sort of questions you wanna ask. Someone presents with a cold sore and a painful red eye, then you're thinking about herpetic eye disease from HSV one. Uh, someone comes in with history of skin disease, so eczema, rosacea, psoriasis, they'd be the most common ones. Then often that's gonna affect the lid margin and the ocular surface. So this will worsen the sort of dry eye, grittiness, uh, relapse and remitting, that sort of uh, presentation. Uh, thyroid patients come in with big bulging red eyes when, when, when they're hot, when their thyroid orbitopathy is hot. It's also known as Graves' disease. You've probably heard of that. Um, so usually bilateral, can be asymmetric, uh, and they'll have red eyes and, and complain of burning and stinging. If it's very bad, vision will be affected. That's rare. Um, but the key thing there is proptosis, that appearance of a really full bulging eye socket. And finally, uh, recent dental work, or sinus infection, that's a red flag for orbital cellulitis. So orbital cellulitis infection of the whole eye socket often goes together with sinusitis, infective sinusitis. And that's, it's a red flag condition in that it can blind people and it can even kill people if it's left untreated or, or treated too late. So that's uh, one that you need to know. I'll cover that in the next lecture, orbital cellulitis. So some of the red flags to be aware of, if the vision is down significantly in one eye compared to the other, 
then you need to have a good hard think about what's going on. Severe pain, I talked about earlier, severe trauma, so a car accident or an explosion, uh, an industrial explosion, to see that from time to time. Contact lens wear always predisposes to corneal infections, a recent surgery or injection uh, I talked about earlier. And finally, if it's a prolonged course and not getting better, particularly if it's unilateral, you've got to think, uh, ha have another think, revisit the history um, and examine them very closely. Okay, so what about examination? What's the, what are the main things you're looking for? Well, look, here's more or less the whole uh, examination of the eye as you guys are expected to know it, but I've bolded the sections that I want you to pay particular attention to, which is infectious precautions. Someone's presenting with red eyes, it could be well be infective, so you don't want to infect yourself or others. So hand hygiene, wear gloves if you need to. Um, be gentle, it's quite easy to hurt patients if you sort of barge in and try and prise the eye open. So um, take a sort of slow and gentle approach and use topical anesthetic if you need it. Don't use topical anesthetic if you suspect that the globe is ruptured or you've got a penetrating eye injury. Anytime you're worried that the wall of the eyeball has been breached in one way or another, you don't put any drops on the eye. That's usually in a really high velocity injury, uh, but there can be exceptions. Gardening is one example. So someone bends down to do something in the garden, they poke themselves with a frond from a plant. Some of these can be really sharp and they can give themselves a full thickness injury through the cornea, which is not necessarily excruciating. Yes, it's painful. Anyway, that's uncommon. The more common thing is conjunctivitis, corneal abrasion, foreign body. These are the common things. And if I get one of those walking through the door, almost the very first thing I do is put in some local anesthetic, some topical anesthetic, because it makes them happy. They think you're great. They think you've already healed them. And more importantly, makes the examination easier. It makes the rest of the consult easier. So do that when you think it's safe to. If you're not sure, don't. Um, gross inspection is important. So are the eyelids involved? Is it just the eye or the eyelids as well? Is the medial canthus involved where the lacrimal sac is? You know, I talked about that earlier. Is it one eye, both eyes, all those sorts of things? Is there a laceration of the eyelid? Could there be an underlying rupture of the globe underneath that lid laceration? Uh, so gross inspection is important. Uh, slit lamp exam is really relevant in ED. So a red eye in ED, you need to have a look at on the slit lamp. Probably can't do that in a GP setting. Fluorescein staining, super relevant for red eye. So is the surface of the cornea intact or not? That's the question you're asking with um, fluorescein staining. So in a corneal abrasion, you're expecting a big green patch somewhere on the eye. Even in conjunctivitis, you can get little green patches of what we call punctate staining, uh, where there is some involvement of the cornea. Eyelid aversion, relevant with red eyes. Is there a foreign body um, hidden under the eyelid somewhere? You'd be surprised. Uh, I saw a kid once at PMH who had red eyelids plus red eye, looked like orbital cellulitis, they had a CT scan and started them on IV antibiotics, but no one had diverted the eyelid. And lo and behold, uh, the whole thing was caused by a subtarsal foreign body. So that was a kid being exposed to radiation because no one had diverted the eyelids. So just do it every single time as part of your uh, red eye examination. Um, unless you suspect a globe rupture, in which case you're not putting pressure on the eye. I mean, if you're in a hospital and there's a globe rupture or you suspect it, pretty much you're waiting for the ophthalmology registrar to get there before you do too much, other than try and assess visual acuity. Don't even try and measure intraocular pressure because that involves putting a tiny bit of pressure on the eye. So visual acuity is probably enough in a suspected globe rupture. Otherwise, it depends on their GCS and their other injuries and so on. That's a whole topic in itself. Okay, so red flags, as I say, multi-trauma um, is important. Red lid, lids and red globe, this could be all the say lice, or it could be a retrovalvular hematoma, which is what we've got here. So that goes together with unable to open the eye. You get a bleed behind the eye, in the eye socket, the whole thing bulges forwards. The eyelids are often quite bruised and edematous, difficult to even open and examine the eye. Often you get a 360 subconjunctival hemorrhage. So these are all red flags for retrobulbar 
hemorrhage. Look out for uveal prolapse on the slit lamp. So that's a little bit of brown or blue, whatever color the iris is, poking out of the cornea somewhere. It may be Seidel's negative or Seidel positive. Seidel's sign is when you put fluorescein on the eye, you're looking at them on the slit lamp and you get almost like a little waterfall effect uh, with fluid, stained fluid trickling out of the eye. So that's anterior chamber fluid, aqueous humor exiting the eye. And that happens if you've got a full thickness penetrating injury or a ruptured globe. Um, I saw that once when I was either an intern or a resident, can't remember. There was a guy who'd been punched in the face. He had a previous corneal graft. The, gra the bottom part of the graft had ruptured. So he had a little waterfall coming out of his eye, which you can't see grossly, but you look at it on the slit lamp and you can see it. Very high intraocular pressure. What is that a red flag for? What was that? Oh, yeah, acute glaucoma. So acute angle closure glaucoma is where you get a very high pressure. So there's some of the red flags on examination to be aware of. Okay, what about some of the approaches to red eye? Um, this is a great time for me to have a sip of water. So um, this is, if a patient's sitting there in front of me, this is probably a good practical real world sort of approach, whereby the first question is, is it traumatic or non-traumatic? The traumatic one most often is gonna be a tradesman or woman. Um, the non-traumatic can be all the other stuff. Um, so infective, what's common? Blepharitis is common. Blepharitis is really inflammatory, not infective, but it doesn't matter. Blepharitis is common, conjunctivitis is common. The other ones are uncommon but serious. When people say corneal ulcer, it's a, it's a funny term because they can mean corneal abrasion, which is a scratch of the cornea, or they can mean an infection of the cornea, which is really, which would really be called microbial keratitis. So if you're gonna see, if you're gonna say corneal ulcer, know what you mean. Is it just an abrasion on its own or is it an infection? Non-infective causes, so these are inflammatory causes, which I talked about earlier, episcleritis, scleritis, um, iritis and uveitis are more or less the same thing. Just depends which part of the uveal tract is, is inflamed. And then you've got acute angle closure glaucoma and some of the other ones. So that's one approach, trauma, traumatic or non-traumatic. Here's uh, the anatomical approach that I, that I touched on at the start. So lids and lashes, blepharitis I've mentioned, a chalazion, which is a collection of waxy secretion, lipid secretion basically, which the eyelids normally produce. All your eyelids produce this stuff. Uh, and when the orifice of the duct that secretes that lipid secretion, the meibomian gland, when that gets blocked, then the meibomian secretion builds up. That's what a chalazion is. So it's a collection of lipid secretion within the eyelid, which is pro-inflammatory. That is different to a sty. People often use the word sty for everything, which is okay, but it's important to try and differentiate infective versus inflammatory. Chalazion is inflammatory. A sty is an infected eyelid, uh, eyelash uh, follicle infection, okay? So the follicle is the base of the eyelash where it inserts into the eyelid. And when the base of that is infected, that's a sty. And on a slit lamp, you should be able to differentiate the two because the sty will be localized around the base of an eyelash. And often there'll be a little bit of pus, a uh, tiny blister of pus on show. Whereas a chalazion is not along the lash line so much. It's more in the mid section of, of the eyelid. So sty think lash line, chalazion think within the eyelid itself. Um, cellulitis can be just of the lids or of the lids and the whole eye socket, so orbital cellulitis. So they're the relevant bits of anatomy there. What can happen to the cornea? Well, you can scratch it, you can get a foreign body on it, you can infect the cornea with either bacteria or viruses, and you can pour chemicals on the cornea. So these are some of the uh, red eye things that localize to the cornea. What about the iris and the pupil? 
Well, they can become inflamed. That's anterior uveitis or iritis. Um, if you have trauma, that can affect the shape of the pupil. Uh, and I'll talk about that in another lecture. And then acute angle closure, you get a fixed mid-dilated pupil. That's a, they're, they're the buzzwords for angle closure, okay? Fixed mid-dilated pupil. So if you hear fixed mid-dilated pupil, high pressure, vision's down, severe pain, that's angle closure, all right? Anterior chamber can be filled with white blood cells, which is what you get in uveitis. So people talk about cells in the anterior chamber. Uh, if you get enough white blood cells in the anterior chamber, what do you get? What does that turn into? Mm -hmm. So the answer is hypopian, which is correct, which is a white fluid level at the bottom of the anterior chamber. Looks like pus. Basically, it is pus. What's a high femur? <clears throat> Anyone? Mm. So it's a blood level within the anterior chamber. What's the commonest cause of a high femur? Mm -hmm. Blunt trauma. Any examples? Have you, have you seen one or, or heard of one? Squash ball is so nasty. Yes. Squash ball is nasty because it's the perfect size uh, to rupture the eyeball. Whereas if you've got a tennis ball or a cricket ball, because they're bigger than the opening of the orbit, the eye socket, the orbit tends to protect the eye from those bigger foreign bodies. But a squash ball is just the right size to perfectly strike the eyeball in the middle and burst it. Golf balls are the same. And I've seen both of those. Uh, so yeah, high femur plus blunt injury, you're thinking about a ruptured globe actually. Okay, Conjun uh, conjunctiva, conjunctivitis, obviously, subconscious hemorrhages. Has anyone had or seen a subconjunctival hemorrhage? Yeah, subconjunctival hemorrhage looks like blood. It really presents differently to all the other causes. Can be associated with trauma, but can happen spontaneously as well. Uh, pterygium, have you guys heard of that? Yeah, so that's like a wing-like growth across the front surface of the eye. Starts in the conjunctiva, can um, grow to cover the cornea. And when they're doing that, we remove them with pterygium surgery. Did one of those yesterday, I think. Yeah, yesterday was Thursday. <clears throat> Okay, and then episcleritis and scleritis, they're inflammation of various layers underneath the conjunctiva. So you've got conjunctiva, episclera, and then sclera. And when those layers get inflamed, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you how to differentiate between episcleritis and scleritis a bit later. <clears throat> and then finally, I think I might have cold, caught my child's sickness. Finally, if you've got cells within the vitreous, the commonest cause of that is uveitis. So that's inflammation of the uveal tract. And what are patients there gonna present with? If you've mainly got what's called vitritis, so vitreous cells, what's that person gonna present with? So you've got cells floating around in the vitreous in front of the fovea, which is what you see here. Yeah, floaters. So floaters, uh, patients can present with floaters when they've got cells in the anterior chamber, basically anywhere along the optical axis. So most commonly in the anterior chamber or in the vitreous or both. So if you see, if you hear floaters, that's what you're thinking. Okay, yet another approach is to go unilateral or bilateral. I'm not going to go into all the uh, causes, uh, but the, the only one I'll this is on US English, as you can see, so it doesn't like the Australian S's. Um, should have corrected that. But uh, the main thing I'll point out is localized versus generalized redness and localized or sectoral redness. Subconscious hemorrhage, I've talked about that. Nothing else really looks like a subconscious hemorrhage. And then you've got episcleritis and scleritis. Everything else tends to be generalized redness. Okay, so that's a good way of thinking about it. And then finally, uh, etiology. So trauma, we've talked about infection, inflammation, and then glaucoma is kind of its own separate thing. Uh, this is what orbital cellulitis looks like. Retrobulbar hemorrhage can look like that, but in this person, it's, uh, it's an infection. This is conjunctivitis. This is a little uh, infection of the cornea. 
so microbial keratitis. Okay, so how are we going for time? Not too bad. Let's get on to some cases, shall we? So here are four pictures of the same thing. So take a moment to look at them and then would someone like to, broadly they're the same thing, they're not exactly the same thing. Um, same umbrella term. So would someone like to suggest what they think it might be? Yep, conjunctivitis. Why do you say that? What, what are the signs there that make you think? You're right. Yep. Sorry, what was that? Say that again. Just in the conjunctiva, yeah. Bilateral, good. Yes, I agree. Yep, that's more likely to be um, bacterial. Yep. And there's one other sign on here, which is useful, which is this. Actually, I think pretty sure I used this in your first lecture, which is looks like the conjunctivus is edematous. Okay. And we call that chemosis. So chemosis very commonly goes together with conjunctivitis. It's not that many things that cause chemosis. Conjunctivitis would be the most common one. So yeah, they're all the signs. So you've got conjunctival injection is what we call that. Injection means redness. Um, bilaterality, chemosis, and then you've got discharge. This is a whitish sort of discharge, quite thick, so more likely to be bacterial. Uh, this person has a clear watery discharge, so more likely to be viral, okay? Well done, we're off to a good start. So infective conjunctivitis, whether it's viral or bacterial, what's going on here? What's the abnormality? You don't need to know what it is, but what's abnormal in that picture? Mm. Is it a little bit of uptake or a lot of uptake? Heaps, yeah. So lots of pinpoint, you know, probably thousands of little areas of pinpoint uptake of fluorescein, which shouldn't be there in a normal eye. So they're called punctate epithelial erosions. Punctate, like a dot. Epithelial, that's a frontmost part of the cornea. Erosion, loss of cells, okay? So you can just say, this is conjunctivitis with involvement of the cornea. This person is gonna be really uncomfortable, okay? You can imagine you've got thousands of little micro abrasions of your eye, it's pretty painful. So let's go through how conjunctivitis presents. So the history is gonna be subacute. Uh, it's not instantaneous onset, it's more like hours to days. Often starts unilateral, becomes bilateral, okay? And often it turns around at about the two week mark. So if you're seeing someone at the one week mark, that's probably the worst that they're going to be. Uh, you often get pre uh, preceding upper respiratory tract symptoms, redness and discharge, obviously, and then they may have photophobia as well. That's not um, uncommon. Uh, as I said earlier, most commonly it's viral. Most of that is due to adenovirus. Uh, minority are from chlamydia. So a chlamydia is a cause of unilateral infective conjunctivitis and uh, often there'll be a history of unprotected sex so if you've got a unilateral very red eye not much discharge uh, and uh, the person sexually active then you can ask about unprotected sex and it's uncommon but you don't want to miss it because it's not going to get better and left untreated it can have complications treatment simple it's a single dose of azithromycin uh, and it's good to do a swab in that situation. It's one of the few situations these days where I do a swab is if I suspect chlamydial conjunctivitis. Not common, but be aware of it. Um, examination wise, we talked about bilateral injection, plus or minus discharge, look for corneal involvement. What's the management? Most viral conjunctivitis, you don't, it's quite conservative. So in the real world, most patients get given Clorsig or chloramphenicol. That's an over-the-counter topical antibiotic. That's not necessary. And in fact, it's leading to antibiotic resistance as in the rest of medicine. So your sort of uh, barn door viral conjunctivitis, it's hand hygiene, so they don't give it to anyone else, including you, okay? Ask them not to share um, personal hygiene stuff, you know, towels and pillow sheets and that sort of thing, because they're gonna be shedding virus for the first several days. And then it's a matter of keeping them comfortable. So analgesia, ice packs, simple lubricating eye drops and time, that's enough. 
they're the things you need to recover. Um, conjunctival swab, if you're not sure. If uh, I don't tend to use topical decongestants, these are vasoconstrictors, which again are available over the counter. Um, they get handed out like lollies, but there's, patients can sort of get addicted whereby they instantly the eye becomes white, person keeps using them, when they stop using them, you get what's called a rebound injection, where the eye's more red, so they have to go back onto them. It's just a waste of time. If you just give it two weeks, it's going to get better anyway. It's a bit like having a head cold. So, um, but if someone's got a wedding coming up or a graduation or something, that's a very good use of a topical decongestant, I think. Yep. Ooh, it used to be, um, but I haven't seen or heard of that being used in, in years now, I would say. Yeah. Have you come across it recently at all? Hmm. Uh, maybe, yeah, not sure. No, I haven't seen that talked about in Australia for probably since I started training over 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, as I say, um, don't use, don't use uh, antibiotics. If you're worried about a corneal infection, so this is not a corneal infection. These are micro abrasions of the cornea, but if you're worried about a true infection, that person really needs to be seen by an ophthalmologist. Corneal infection is dangerous. Um, and if you're not worried about a corneal infection, then don't use an antibiotic unless there's actually a ton of corneal involvement. If it looks like this, I think okay to use antibiotic because this person's now predisposed to getting a secondary bacterial infection. But if the cornea looks okay, it's just conjunctivitis, leave them alone. Don't use topical steroid pretty much ever without talking to an ophthalmologist. As I said, it can make many conditions worse. Uh, and if you're concerned, if the VA is poor, it's been going on for too long, etc., then obviously discuss with or, or refer to an ophthalmologist. Okay, so that's conjunctivitis, infective conjunctivitis. Here's our next case. So a young person, let's say, this is unilateral, severe pain, uh, vision's affected, okay? That's the information you get. This is the OSCE station now, and you get given this image. So can I have a spot diagnosis? This should be a spot diagnosis based on the obvious abnormality. So if you're not sure what the diagnosis is, just go to the, what's the obvious abnormality? Anyone? Microca, yes, that's the diagnosis, but let's, let's sort of, let's just follow it logically. So everyone arrives at microbial keratitis. The obvious, obvious abnormality is what in both of these pictures? There's not actually, well, there actually, <laughs> there's a tiny, <laughs> There's a tiny slit hypopian here, but that's a fluke. <laughs> that's a total fluke. Um, why is there a tiny slit hypopian here? Why is there a hypopian there? Again, think about it kind of logically. Hypopian is what? White blood cells in, in the anterior chamber, in front of the iris. So when there's a lot of white blood cells, then you get a hypopian. So there are a lot of white blood cells in this person's anterior chamber, why? Yeah, yeah. So it's fighting something else. And there is an ulcer there, but more simply than that, the obvious abnormality, there's a circular white blob on the cornea. Shouldn't be there, right? In both of these pictures. So this is what a bacterial infiltrate of the cornea looks like, okay? There's pretty much nothing else that looks quite like this. So if you see a roundish or oval shaped, um, dense white circle, let's, let's call it, on the cornea, then you're thinking about a corneal, a bacterial corneal infection, okay? What's the most common predisposing risk factor to this sort of infection? Does anyone know? Contact lenses. Yep. So in your OSCE station or in real life, when they say, what further history would you like to ask? You ask about that. 
You also ask about diabetes as a cause of immunosuppression and ask about other uh, pre previous episodes. That's a good one to ask about, okay? Um, and whether they've had any treatment yet, whether they've got their contact lenses there with them. So remember to ask for all of those things. So if we go through it from top of, there's your big hypopian there, okay? Let's go through it from top to bottom. So very painful. This is the hallmark, severe pain, unilateral. I've never seen concurrent bilateral microbial keratitis. Severe pain, unilateral, visions down, hours to days, contact lens wear, or possibly trauma, that's the other. So I scratched my eye a couple of days ago and now it's really, really painful. It's gotten worse rather than better, okay? Mainly it's gram-positive bacteria. So, um, you know, the commensal flora that live around the eyelid, staph species, they're the most common causes. The two imp other important causes are pseudomonas, which is associated with contact lens wear. So at least one of those previous pictures was, previous, was probably pseudomonas. And then acanthamoeba, which is uh, found in tap water and often happens if a person cleans their contact lenses with tap water or sits them in tap water instead of contact lens solution. So acanthamoeba produces what's called a ring infiltrate, which looks like this and very, very painful. So, okay, so you think, this person's actually got multiple infiltrates, if you look there. Looking at them, you're gonna look at them on the slit lamp, okay? And the main thing is the whitish corneal infiltrate. They might have cells or a hypopian. Um, and as I said, unilateral and so on, with an overlying epithelial defect. So you do put fluorescein on these guys. So you'll have the white lesion and over the top of it, you'll have green staining. So that part of the cornea has lost its epithelium, okay? The rest of the cornea won't stain so much. Management, take both contact lenses out. If they're a contact lens, why put them aside? Um, your job is to give them oral analgesia and get them in front of, front of an ophthalmologist the same day. So this is a same day referral, not next day, definitely not next week. Um, so if that means emergency department, so be it. Um, otherwise, local community ophthalmologist or whoever. What do we do? It's good for you guys to know because you can give this advice to the patient. Um, possibly admission, that's the short answer, particularly for a big enough infiltrate, possibly admission. Then what we do is anesthetize the eye, do what's called a corneal scrape, which means with a little bent tip needle, we scrape cells off of that infiltrate and then put them into various plates for culture to, to get a diagnosis. And then we start them on broad spectrum antibiotics around the clock. So, a uh, drop every hour um, around the clock. That's why it's better to do as a hospital admission. And they often stay in hospital for several days, if not a week or more. Uh, that's, that's the expected time course. The outcome really depends on how early or late they presented, where the infiltrate is, and then what the bacteria is. Um, hopefully they present early. Okay, so that's microbial keratitis. This is a site-threatening condition. It's definitely a red flag condition. Okay, so next case. I'm not gonna give you too much history. Unilateral painful red eye. Recently, they've been a bit unwell. What's that obvious abnormality? So what was that? Dendritic ulcer, what's a, what's a dendritic ulcer? Yes, you're right, yep. That thing on the screen, yes. So dendrite means branch, so it kind of looks like a branch. <coughs> and it's staining with fluorescein, so you know you've lost epithelial cells. This is a corneal ulcer. So what are the commonest causes of dendritic ulcer? Yes, because that's what we said earlier. Well done, good memory. Um, so how do, they, how do those two present? How do you differentiate? So patients walk in the room, what makes you think HSV1? What makes you think herpes zoster? Which is, involved, which is more common in what? BZV. Uh, and which dermatome, you know? Yes, there. So facial nerve 
first division, ophthalmic division of the facial nerve. Um, sorry, not facial nerve, trigeminal nerve. Uh, so, and what about HSV1? What, what do they? Yeah, cold source. Yep, yep. So, that, so very simply there, that, that's, that's how you differentiate. Uh, so this lady's clearly got a zoster rash. So if this was the photo in front of you, or the patient in front of you, give me the two most important things in that photo as far as an ocular assessment is concerned. If you've established that it's a zoster rash, tick, what are the two most other important things? Yeah, what's that called? And what does that signify? The eye is much more likely to be involved. Hutchinson sign means the nasociliary nerve is involved, which means the eye is involved, almost always. Um, and what's the other important thing in her? The eye is red, okay? So if you're doing a phone consult for herpes zoster, you, the thing that guides the urgency of the referral, so if it's today or if it's tomorrow, let's say, is, is the tip of the nose affected by the rash? That's Hutchinson's sign. And then is the eye red or is the eye white on the affected side? She's got a red eye. So she's at least got conjunctivitis, if not keratitis from a corneal ulcer, dendritic ulcer, okay? Then they can also get uveitis. You can get anterior uveitis, posterior uveitis. You can get the full works with HZO. With HZO. You can actually get an optic neuritis. You can get a retinitis. This is a potentially blinding condition. And yeah, your sort of triggers for action, are involvement of the tip of the nose and red eye. So usually unilateral, often they've been a bit sick recently, unwell, run down, there's other stuff going on. Uh, obviously you're thinking about a rash with HZO. Um, HSV1 is more common than VZV. So this is actually the less common presentation. And these are the types of predisposing um, background history. So immunosuppression or recent illness. Examination-wise, look for skin vesicles on the eyelid with HSV1. You don't get a spectacular rash like this, but go looking for other vesicles. With HZO or herpes zoster ophthalmicus, Hutchinson sign, do perform fundoscopy because you can have a retinitis or, or an optic neuritis that's just starting to brew, if you like, develop, uh, and you don't want to miss that because it changes the management. What is the management? Well, with HSV1, it's the mainstay is topical antiviral, okay? So that's a cyclovir ointment five times a day for one to two weeks. You want to reassess these people within a week. So HSV1, you're thinking topical antiviral cream, Herpes zoster, you're thinking oral antiviral treatment. And that's, you've got to catch it within 72 hours for that to be effective. There's lots of different regimes. Valacyclovir is one, but there's others. You can use acyclovir. Valacyclovir I like because it's a TDS dose, so one gram TDS. Use an antibiotic skin cream for the face if you need it. Um, there may be a role for oral treatment of HSV1 disease. That's really a, uh, an ophthalmic um, decision, lots of criteria for that. Um, but in the ED or in the GP setting, if it's clearly HZO uh, or just shingles, then you're starting them on oral antiviral and talking to one of us. Uh, and if you suspect HSV, then start them on an oral, uh, anti uh, sorry, a topical antiviral, a cyclovir ointment and, and talk to one of us. Uh, both of these need to be seen by, by ophthalmology. Um, don't forget oral, uh, analgesia and definitely no steroids because this is a sitting duck. I had a lady last year who had been started on steroids for HSV1 keratitis. And by the time she presented to me, the whole cornea was opacified. So she's effectively blind in the eye she may well go on to need a corneal graft down the track because the opacified cornea is going to scar. She's not going to be able to see well. 
So it still happens. Um, rule of thumb, no steroids. Okay. Any questions so far? Happy, clear as mud. Good. Next condition. Gee, it's good that this talk was shortened because I can feel my own voice starting to fade. Um, what do we have here? Let's do it like we did before. So obvious abnormality, let's start with this picture. What's the obvious abnormality here? Anyone? Say that again? Yeah, yeah there's something in the eye. What do you think it could be? Different person. That person's scored too many points now. What, what kind of thing looks brown and sits on the surface of the eye? Often it's a bit of metal. A bit of metal with underlying rust and the rust looks brownish. So you've got a corneal foreign body there. What's this one? What's going on here? What's the abnormality? What's that? Taking up a stain, yep. So what is it? What, what is it that's staining? It's the cornea, right? Therefore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got something's traumatized the cornea. So if you see that, that's corneal abrasion, okay? So you see a big patch of missing corneal epithelium. If it's staining, it means the epithelium's missing. So that's, that's what a corneal abrasion is. It's an area of missing epithelium. And then what's this pattern down here? Yep, why, why do you say that? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's similar to the analogy there is you've got a pebble stuck under your windscreen wiper on your car. So it's just scratching the, uh, the windscreen every time it moves, uh, and they're called linear corneal abrasions. But the way you describe them is perfectly fine. Um, so these are various presentations of ocular trauma, okay? So we're gonna talk about corneal abrasions first. Here's another one. Um, usually it's sudden onset or often it's sudden onset, sometimes with preceding trauma, usually unilateral. And the vision is obviously gonna be blurred if it's affecting the visual axis. Epiphora means watering. So you've got a scratch on your eye, it's going to water. Has anyone had a corneal abrasion in the room? No? I've had three, weirdly enough. Uh, one of which was before my first clinical exam in ophthalmology training. Uh, so I was outdoors and we were practicing our examination technique, got a foreign body under my lid somehow. Um, we were in like a public garden and it's excruciatingly painful, I can tell you. It was half an hour before the exam. The exam was in an eye hospital in Melbourne, so I went into the emergency department. They removed the foreign body. Now I had a corneal abrasion. So then I had to put in topical anti uh, anesthetic drops during the clinical exam, which got me through. I passed and should have been given a medal, I thought. But... Um, <laughs> But the point there is that it often happens outside and it's very painful. Uh, and it's instantaneous onset because you've got a highly sensitive structure. It gets scratched. You're not waiting for days to present. But people are in pain. Uh, so that's how it presents. Uh, more, again, more common in contact lens wearers because they take, they're taking stuff, they're putting stuff in and out of the eye. So they're more liable to scratch their eye accidentally. Uh, and if it's recurrent, you've got to ask why. And often there'll be an underlying corneal disease where the surface of the eye becomes a bit unstable. So they're prone to getting abrasions more, more commonly. Examination-wise, uh, fluorescein staining, the linear orientation we talked about. Be sure to exclude an infection. So yes, I've got an abrasion, but before you stain them, abrasions are clear. You know, there's no whiteness, there's no opacity anywhere on the cornea. So you've got to ask yourself, is this just an uncomplicated abrasion or is there, is there an associated infiltrate like those white blobs that we saw earlier? So you have to satisfy yourself by asking that question. Uh, and then make sure you look for foreign bodies because easy to have a, 
easy to have an abrasion and then miss a fine body, okay? Uh, Management-wise, if you suspect an infection, that's a same-day referral. The mainstay of management is topical antibiotics. So drops plus or minus ointment, take your pick more or less. If the person needs to have good vision for work, then I give them drops and ointment at night time. Um, if they're not working or they're gonna take time off work anyway, then ointment's probably better, it's thicker. Ointment just blurs your vision, but it's better, it has a better lubricating effect. Um, it doesn't really matter. You just wanna give them a topical antibiotic to go home with. Otherwise they're at risk of infection. Um, oral analgesia, patching if they want it. I, I, you know, I offer patching, but I don't do it routinely. It's neither here nor there, my point of view. Um, follow up within a week, whether that's with you or with us. Uh, and again, no steroids. So that's corneal abrasion, a scratch of the surface of the eye. Okay, common, very common. What about foreign bodies? Well, most common thing here is grinding. And so usually it's a boilermaker or some other tradesperson who commonly grinds. Often they've had more than one. So often it's their third, fourth presentation. Um, they all should wear protective goggles, but the way these little foreign bodies work is they can move in arcs. So you can be wearing goggles and still get a foreign body that flies sort of in a circular path and pings onto their cornea. Uh, gardening is another common cause of corneal foreign bodies. Um, on examination, obviously try and find the foreign body by averting the eyelid. Uh, even if there's one on the cornea, still evert the eyelid. Uh, look for rust around a metal foreign body. The reason I've said beware hammering is with, it, with hammering, you can get a foreign body on the surface and a penetrating intraocular foreign body. And a penetrating uh, intraocular foreign body can cause virtually no symptoms, believe it or not. So hammering is a, is a dangerous one for that. What that means is you've got to do fundoscopy. And if you're worried at all, then you need to be sending them to us, okay? Um, management wise, make sure there was no chemical involved. You know, like nothing exploded. There was no burst can or hose or something like that. Because if it's a foreign body plus a chemical injury, then they need irrigation, which is a whole separate thing. Okay, I'll cover that another time. Uh, if it's just a foreign body, then you would have covered this in the clinical skills workshop last week, uh, I think it was. So a topical anesthetic, then use either a cotton tip or a needle. I start with a cotton tip, and if that doesn't do the job, then I move to a needle. Uh, and then if there's a rust ring, there's a device called an ophthalmic burr, which most emergency departments will have. So don't be afraid to use those or learn from a registrar how to use those. And we use those to polish off a little bit of rust. Rust is toxic to the cornea, so you don't want to leave it there. Cover them with topical antibiotics again, oral analgesia, don't forget, and then follow up within a week. Uh, and here's an example of how to remove a foreign body with a needle. So the bevel's up. My sort of principles are stabilize yourself on the slit lamp. So you've got your elbow resting on the slit lamp. Have your hand or your wrist resting somewhere on the slit lamp support or on their forehead. So you've got two points of contact and then you've got good dexterity with your first finger and your thumb and have the bevel facing towards you. Obviously you wanna be visualizing it well. So you've got one hand on the slit lamp. In reality, I get the slit lamp in position, then use your off hand to raise their upper eyelid so they're not blinking. Give them a target to look at so you don't have a moving target and then get your needle in behind the foreign body and lift it off. Uh, as I say, try with a cotton tip first, often that works. Just moisten the tip of the cotton tip um, with topical anesthetic. So it's a sterile cotton tip and it's a sterile anesthetic bottle. Um, see if you can remove it with that, often you can. If not, then use a needle. So foreign body is common, corneal abrasion is common. You will see these in emergency. So just get behind the slit lamp, learn from the reg and um, practice. Okay, the hallmark thing here, I'm gonna give you this answer because it's probably a bit trickier than the others, is that the redness or the injection is very localized. Do you agree? So look, the top part of the eye is white, but the temporal aspect is red. It doesn't have to be temporal, it could be anywhere, but the point is it's sectoral. 
So when you see sectoral injection, you're thinking episcleritis or scleritis. Next, you're thinking, does this person have an underlying rheumatological condition that is perhaps untreated or undiagnosed? Okay. Um, redness pain, they're, they're really the common things. Not so much discharge. If it's scleritis, severe pain. Episcleritis, more mild to moderate pain. Okay. So that's one of the ways that you differentiate. Let's talk about episcleritis. So red eye discomfort, I've talked about that. They may have had a preceding illness, not necessarily. Here's your sectoral involvement. The nasal aspect is completely white, okay? Most commonly, actually idiopathic. And for a first presentation, I'll take a history, but I won't go investigating for other things. If it's a second presentation or if it's a severe presentation, then you've got to go looking. So blood tests for various things, rheumatoid factor, ANA, et cetera, for rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. Um, less commonly, it's infectious. Really at your level, you're thinking, is it idiopathic first presentation or do they have systemic symptoms or it's a second presentation and I need to go looking for other causes, okay? Examination-wise sectoral injection, more often unilateral. The different main differential scleritis. I'll talk about scleritis separately at the, at the next lecture. And management-wise, you can certainly start them on a topical non uh, sorry, oral non-steroidal tablets. Nothing wrong with that. That'll get them halfway there. But the mainstay of treatment here is topical steroid treatment. And so for that reason, um, they need to see one of us. This is sort of you know, if you're happy, it's not severe pain. And if you're happy, it's not, so happy it's not scleritis. Scleritis is, can definitely be a threat to vision. Episcleritis tends not to be. Um, so this tends to be next day, review by ophthalmology is fine. Um, particularly if you started them on, on oral and non-steroidal. Just make sure the cornea is clear. That's the take home from today. Make sure that there's no corneal infiltrate, okay? That's episcleritis. Now we've got a few signs here, which you may not have seen before. So is this pupil normal or abnormal? Obviously abnormal. Anyone know what these things are called? Have you come across this yet? Synechia, yeah, posterior synechia. So they're parts where, uh, the parts that are more central are where the pupil is actually stuck to the iris. And the pupil stuck to the iris, sorry, to the lens. Uh, the iris is stuck to the lens uh, in those areas because it becomes inflamed and it becomes sticky. Uh, the parts where it's pouching outwards, that's the normal dilation of the iris. This is the iris trying to dilate normally. These are the areas where it's stuck. So this is a hallmark for what condition? And are you an optometrist or what's the story here? <laughs> Um, this is a hallmark for anterior uveitis. What's this, not the most high resolution picture, but what, what am I trying to show you here? This is a slit lamp beam uh, looking transversely. Here it's intersecting the cornea, you agree? Here it's landing on the iris, there's the pupil. What's in between the iris pupil and the cornea? What's this space called? The anterior chamber, what should the anterior chamber look like in a normal person when you've got light going across it? Should there be stuff in it or not? No, it should be clear. So if you've got the black backdrop of the pupil, okay, that's your backdrop, the pupil. And in front of that, you've got light and your light beams in the anterior chamber. You shouldn't really be able to see anything. It should be like lighting a torch onto a black screen. But if you got lots of what looks like dust within that view, they're cells in the anterior chamber, okay? So this is anterior chamber inflammation. This is what cells look like when we talk about cells in the anterior chamber. So this is the second sort of hallmark of anterior uveitis. So you've got posterior synechia, you've got anterior chamber cells. Uh, what are these dots? Keratic precipitates, yep. 
So I saw a guy with these yesterday. So they are collections of white blood cells. So you've got these white blood cells floating around in the anterior chamber. Naturally, some of them are going to coalesce and sit on the inner surface of the cornea, okay? The inner surface, the corneal endothelium, and they're keratic precipitates. So this could easily be, let's say, an OSCE station. And these are all really classic signs. This should be a spot diagnosis because at your level, nothing else causes these things, okay? Oh, I've got cells in the anterior chamber. The iris is malformed and misshapen and what, there's dots on the corneal, on, on the inside of the cornea. Looks like anterior uveitis to me. What's the history that fits with that? Photophobia is the main thing. So the main, that to differentiate it from other causes, okay? Uh, more commonly unilateral. Uh, photophobia, the matrix. vision off and down. They may have floaters. We talked about floaters earlier in uveitis. So it can, can be bilateral, but more commonly unilateral. And then underlying rheumatological disease, similar to episcleritis and scleritis. This is most commonly immune mediated. Can be infective, um, but more commonly immune mediated. The most common association is ankylizing spondylitis. Okay, so a rheumatological condition. Uh, most of those guys are HLA B27 positive. So if I've got a recurrent patient with anterior uveitis, or if I've got a bilateral first presentation, I'm testing for HLA B27, particularly in young people. That's the most common association. So they then need physiotherapy and non-steroidals for, you know, for their ankh spond, um, spinal problems. Probably even more common than that is just idiopathic. So often we go investigating with anterior uveitis and there's no definite cause. Um, and then there are other causes. Uh, another key thing on examination is what we call limbal injection. So do you see how it's read particularly at the corneal limbus? The limbus being the interface between the cornea and the sclera. So out here, not so red. In here, much more red. So that's a sort of classic sign for anterior uveitis as well. Keratic precipitates, posterior sinica, we've talked about. They can get a hypopian. If it's really bad uveitis, they can get a hypopian. Pain on examining the... This means that... So let's say you've got unilateral inflammation and I shine a torch into your good eye and the red eye hurts. Why do you think that might be? Any thoughts? If I shine a torch into this eye, what happens to the other eye? Pupil constricts. So if your iris is inflamed, it's the iris that's constricting. If the iris is inflamed and you're stimulating that muscle, that's painful. So this, uh, this is a good diagnostic test for uveitis versus other causes of unilateral acute red eye. Is there pain when I shine a torch into the unaffected eye? Management pretty much is referred to us. You're not gonna manage this out there in the community. Plus or minus rheumatology, if you suspect there's an underlying diagnosis, Tell them to wear their sunnies. Photophobia is the, you know, can be debilitating. Um, wear their sunnies till they get to us. And what we will do, the mainstay of treatment for us is topical steroids, if not periocular steroids, which means injecting a steroid in or around the eye, various ways of doing that. And then if it's chronic, severe, or has a systemic association, then they'll need systemic uh, immunosuppression and probably co-management with a rheumatologist or, or a clinical immunologist. So that's anterior uveitis, most commonly unilateral photophobia, plus or minus systemic um, rheumatological disease. Getting towards the end. So just want to highlight a few conditions that are absolute red flags in the real world um, and definitely in the OSCE situation. Uh, and so these are threats to either sight or life or both. Orbitocellulitis is a threat to sight and life, severe trauma, car accident, that sort of thing, sight and life. Retrobulbar hemorrhage, certainly be sight and life, because if the impact has been bad enough to give a bleed into the eye socket, then they may have a subdural or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Microbial keratitis, not so much life, but definitely sight blinds people all the time. Angle closure, th threat to sight, certainly, because if they're not treated quickly, 
uh, they're going to rapidly develop an optic neuropathy and then be blind in the eye. So, you know, if you come across any of these in real life or at an OSCE, almost out loud to yourself, but certainly in an OSCE situation, say, this is a threat to sight or this is a threat to life or this is a, a serious condition or a dangerous condition. And that'll immediately tell us as the examiners, okay, the, you know, this person's going to be safe out there in the world. We did that for our specialist exams. So it just tells a person that you know where this thing fits in the scheme of things. Uh, I had this slide up on my last lecture. It's just to reiterate, remember oral analgesia anytime someone's in pain. It's easy to forget that. Um, don't use topical anesthetic drops on discharge. Don't use steroid drops on discharge unless you've had a chat to one of us. Uh, so hopefully we've covered those things today. That's me um, for today. Um, I wasn't planning on doing a second red eye talk, but it looks like I'm going to have to. So how's this? Friday time slot for you guys in general for the next few weeks.